Hi, I'm Kaylee, and I'm the project intern at Queen's University Library. As you may already know, Queen's has an important connection to Treaty 9, or the James Bay Treaty, which covers a massive portion of land in northern Ontario. This is something we highlighted for Treaty Week, which takes place in the first week of November every year. In our university archives, we have the diary of Daniel George McMartin, one of three treaty commissioners who traveled to northern Ontario to negotiate, big scare quotes around this, Treaty 9 with First Nations in the area. We already know that the meeting of the minds piece was dubious in this scenario. Treaties came pre-written, and a language barrier existed between negotiating parties. Still, the importance of McMartin's diary is his account of what was communicated to First Nations verbally. While many treaty rights are limited in the written document, this diary shows that these limiting clauses were not mentioned as the treaty was being explained. With this in mind, the late Grand Chief Stan Ludet and others have argued that what was communicated orally constitutes the real agreement. During Treaty Week, the Queen's Archives invited Murray Klippenstein, lawyer for the Muscogee Council in the James Bay region, to speak on the importance of the diary as the council seeks legal recourse. This got me thinking. Indigenous groups have critiqued treaties for decades, both for the manipulation preceding their signing, like we see in the James Bay Treaty, and in the spirit of treaties not being lived up to. While treaties are meant to be agreements between sovereign nations, history tells us that the Canadian state has been, and arguably continues to be, deeply paternalistic towards Indigenous peoples and governments. With all this in mind, we ought to situate McMartin's diary within a broader historical narrative. Canada is a nation founded on the devaluation of Indigenous peoples. While McMartin's diary has had an enormous utility in spaces where the written word reigns supreme, see the Canadian legal system, it exposes truths Indigenous people themselves have been aware of for centuries. We do a great disservice to reconciliation when we fail to recognize the voices of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. It's for this reason that I want to make sure we had a focus on Indigenous peoples' interpretations of treaties in the display. While certainly having legal implications, treaties also have widespread, very human effects. My favorite thing we've included to this end is Trick or Treaty, a documentary by Alanis Mbaswin. Trick or Treaty is a human story. We see the legal issues, but also the mix of resilience and frustration that goes into Indigenous activism. In saying all this, I don't need to be negative. Progress has been made, and that's a good thing. I mean to point out that there is still work to be done. Canadians have a duty to challenge their own inherited biases. Who are we more willing to believe, and why? Whose activism is regarded as altruistic, and whose activism is an annoyance? To have any hope of living up to reconciliation, we need to ask these questions.